everyone are you able to hear me yes okay so um uh, yeah good afternoon to all of you uh, and yeah i think we we'll, we are going to start the second week of uh, the tuesday's classes um so i think hope everybody who wanted to be here are already here we had king joffrey who had to leave to attend more important matters in the king's landing i guess we still have swag lord so let's start today's class and let me start sharing my screen yeah uh before we start today's class uh, i want to give you a short um, announcement about last week's uh, recording so that uh, we are still not able to convert it from the basic zoom format to the normal video format so that's why there's no uh, announcement yet on brightspace uh, if we are not able to convert maybe we'll have another small session where we can discuss if you have any more uh, doubts about last week so uh, today's lecture is on the qx simulator and how to do quantum programming so uh, before we like start programming in quantum let us know uh, let us have a look at whether we can do anything better than quantum uh, well unfortunately as for now the answer is well no quantum computers is as good as computing can get with our current laws of physics which uh, which we all know as not really complete so we really do not have the theory of everything per se so uh, theoretically speaking computing can get better well we can have something called as quantum gravity computers so if you have looked at uh, interstellar the movie i highly recommend that uh, where we go near a black hole where time slows down so we can do a lot of computation um in let's say in a and uh, respect to the outside world but we do not have that yet so to actually get such kind of quantum uh, such kind of quantum gravity computers we have to break at least one law of physics or quantum uh, quantum mechanics so computing uh, as we know it with our current laws of physics is as good as we, uh, like quantum computers are as good as we can get and there are theoreticians uh, computer theorists who still researches on such computers such theoretical models of computers based on even better theory so scott aronson is one of them you can look at the article that uh, the link is given on this page and you can access the pdf later on from brightspace so uh, let's say we have quantum computers and then uh, we also have classical computers so we have the cc classical computer and quantum computer and how do how do they compare to each other that's also something that we need to understand before we start using a quantum computer do we re really need a computer for a particular application that uh, we are looking at so let's assume we have a same sized quantum computer and classical computers of course with the current uh, technology level we do not have quantum computers as big or as efficient as classical computers yet that's one of the reasons why we research right but let's say we have uh, just for the sake of comparison we have a quantum computer and a classical computer of the same size so quantum computers or the theoretical model of it quantum turing machines can always simulate a classical computer or the universal turing machine why is that because in quantum computers we have the universal gate set you might have uh, come across it in your uh, quarter 1 course fundamentals of quantum information where we have the the universal gate set in quantum computers like the hadamard and the toffoli so that these are all the different types of uh, universal gate sets that gate sets that we can have let's say the first one the hadamard and the toffoli with hadamard and toffoli we can do all the universal uh, we can do all the unitaries that are there in quantum computation also another gate set is like the cx or the c0 and we have rotation across any two axes it can be the uh, z and y or x and z or any of the other two. another discrete uh, universal set is the c0 gate the hadamard and the t gate so we have this universal gate sets in quantum computation whereas in classical computation again we have this universal gates like and or and not together 
We also have the NAND, which itself is an universal gate set, but along with that, we also need fan out. So uh, one signal getting, uh, getting split into two different signals, which is not natively allowed in uh, quantum computers because of the uh, no cloning theorem. But there's a way to do it as long as we are dealing with classical information. So as long as we are dealing with only zeros and ones, it's, it's okay to copy as long as we are not do, dealing with a superposition state. And that can be done very easily with just one quantum gate, which is the Toffoli or the controlled controlled knot CCX. So let's say this is the Toffoli gate. Yeah, uh, most of you already know how a Toffoli gate works. It's, uh, just as long as both the controls are one, this get, uh, the C signal gets flipped. So with this Toffoli gate, we can implement the classical NAND. So if we have two inputs and we set the third one to uh, the perfect pure state of one, then in the output, we'll get the NAND, uh, gate, the NAND signal of A and B. Whereas if we have one A and zero, so we set the first qubit to one, which means that it is always high, which is equivalent to saying we don't even have this uh, signal. So it's basically a C naught gate, which is, uh, which is the equivalent circuit of it. So we have the first signal coming in in the B, uh, B line and we have zero over here. So that will copy it. It will make it B, B or A, A in this uh, example. So that's a way to copy information with C naught gate as long as we are again dealing with only zeros and ones. So uh, with the Toffoli gate, we can uh, reproduce the effect of a NAND and a fan out, which means that we can do everything that a classical computer can do with just one uh, quantum gate. We didn't even use the Hadamard yet of the universal gate set uh, in quantum computation. Whereas the other way around, uh, if you look at classical computers, classical computer can also always simulate quantum computation, but with the worst case exponential time. So that is rather important to us. And that is one of the reasons we can in the first place, because with classical computation, we can effectively simulate all of uh, quantum computers. And in theoretical computer science terms, it means that we cannot do what's called a super computation quantum computer. So even with quantum computers, we are limited to what, what everything that an universal Turing machine can do, except that in some problems we can we can exponentially speed them up, like uh, in the Shor's factorization. So um, this is what's called as the uh, different complexity classes. Of course, there are an entire zoo of complexity classes, so uh, like we don't need to know all of them. But what's important to us as a com uh, quantum computing uh, quantum computer scientist is this BQP class, which is the full the acronym of bounded error quantum polynomial time class, which means uh, like it says that which are the problems that we can solve in a polynomial time in a quantum computer, provided we have some bound on the error. So uh, we are allowed to make some errors um, approximately one third of the time, which can uh, like, that's not very strict. If we keep on repeating, we can always amount of errors. So given a boundation on the errors, what are the problems that we can solve on a quantum computer in polynomial time? So that uh, gives us the BQP class, which is definitely bigger than the P class in classical computation. So in uh, P class refers to polynomial time, all the problems that we can solve in a classical computer in polynomial time. But the boundary uh, where BQP lies with respect to the harder things that uh, we can do on a classical uh, computers, or rather we cannot do on a classical computer is not really clear. So that's of course an active uh, field of research right now to, uh, to see what are the different problems that we can speed up in a quantum computers or are there really any foundations to using quantum computers as well for all the problems that we cannot do on a classical uh, system. So one of the important things, uh, important results in this field is even with quantum computers, we cannot solve complete problems in polynomial time. So NP complete problems refers to the, the hardest problems that lies in the non-deterministic polynomial time class in uh, classical computation. And one of the results is that even with quantum computers, we cannot speed them up, which means, uh, which like another way to look at it is factorial. We know with Schwartz, uh, Schwartz algorithm, we can speed it up uh, with respect in a, a quantum computer. 
but that's one of the evidences that maybe factorial doesn't lie in the NP complete class. That's not uh, proved yet, but most people believe that since we have a quantum algorithm which can speed up uh, factorization in the quantum scenario, it lies in the NP class. It's definitely not polynomial time, but it's not NP complete either. It lies in this part of the circle. So since we have, uh, since both these computing models are equivalent in some way that we can do everything that a quantum computer can do uh, on a classical computer, we can simulate them and that's not always advantageous. But the other way around, since we can always do what a classical computer can do on a quantum computer, why not use a quantum computer every single time? Well, we will love to do that, except that we don't have a quantum computer that big yet. This, well, the, we don't have a same sized, the first assumption that we had that let's take a same size quantum computer and classical computer. Unfortunately, we don't have it yet. And the quantum computers today, even if we have a same size quantum computer, they are still too noisy and costly. So maybe in the future, like looking ahead, this will never be the case where we'll use quantum computers for every single operations. We know that for many models of quantum computers, we need to cool them down to uh, really very near to the absolute zero. So it, it's going to remain costly, the entire setup around it, but it's really hard to predict what, what happens in the future. Like the initial days of the classical computers, they were as big as the buildings, like one, one or two floors. So uh, for now, the idea is we'll use classical computers for all the problems where it, it's good enough, like quantum computers don't really offer a lot of speed up. For the problems where the quantum, quantum algorithms offer a lot of speed up, we are going to offload it to the, uh, to the quantum computer. So let's look at what are the core classes of problems where quantum computers are good at. So how do we, just looking at the problems, how can we uh, know that this, this is one of the interesting avenues to explore in quantum computation that we should try to find an algorithm to map it on the quantum computer. The first difference is parallelism versus superposition. So in classical computers, earlier we had the CPUs, but now we have um, accelerators like the GPUs, the graphics uh, processing units. They have a lot of cores. They have thousands of cores and they can do a lot of things in parallel. While some of the nice explanations of uh, quantum computers, uh, like quantum computation says that we can access a lot of parallelism on quantum computers as well. This is not really true. Like this is partly true. Uh, we can do a lot of things in parallel in a quantum computers, but there's always a catch. There's a catch of, um, of observing the superposition state, which brings us down to just one of the values that a superposition can hold uh, based on the probability abilities of the amplitudes. So this is how it, uh, it looks like on the uh, fully parallel hardware, what's known as embarrassingly parallel. These problems are things like, let's say mat matrix multiplication, where we need the answer to every single element at the end. We, we want the answer for every single point on the multiplied mat matrix. And uh, this is really uh, difficult to do on a quantum, uh, quantum algorithm because at the end we need all the states. So getting all the states means you need to measure out that many number of times at least. And again, uh, quantum is very probabilistic. So every time we cannot say that if we measure out four, four times, we run the algorithm four times, we are going to get the answers for each one of the outputs that we want. What quantum computers are really good at rather is to get a statistical uh, statistical central tendency of the output. So this is what quantum computers are rather good at, where we want to interact the solutions in such a way that at the end, we want some statistics of the answer. So we want some central tenden tendency of the answer. So this is broadly one of the classes of problems that uh, we are going to look at uh, when we are going to map an application to a quantum computers. But again, this itself, this, um, this type of evolution itself is also there in uh, classical computers, what's known as probabilistic uh, algorithms or probabilistic uh, classical algorithms, which, which is the equivalent of the BQ, uh, BQP class that I just uh, told you about. So that's called as the BPP class, the bounded error 
probabilistic polynomial time algorithm in classical computers. So what exactly is the difference of that? So this is how the BPP class looks at uh, looks like. So every time at the end, like at this stage, we have different probabilities of the output. So plus plus is somewhat uh, mid medium. This is a low pro probable output. This is a very high probable output. And effectively, we want this answer out. Like we want this answer from the system. So we interact them. We uh, we make a probabilistic histogram of the output. And this is what we see. So we get the answer, the, the answer that we want with this much amount of um, probability with respect to the others. The problem with this is once we have a probability over here, let's say plus, we, it never goes to zero. So we always have some probability of, the, of getting the answer that, that we do not want at all. That is wh where quantum comes in. Since we have complex amplitudes and we are, uh, instead of interacting the probabilities, we are interacting the amplitudes out which are complex numbers so they can cancel out effectively and we can get a much higher. Uh, so this is the one that we do not want. So this is negative. It's kind of affecting all the positive values. It's, uh, it's canceling out some part of the probabilities from each of the answers that we want. And that is giving us a much higher probability of getting the answer that we want. So the complex amplitudes can cancel out. And this is what is the destructive interference of the amplitudes. And this is the major power of the quantum uh, computation, the quantum algorithm, where we can cancel out our non-solutions so that we can increase the probability of the solution. So that said, uh, let's look at the different levels of quantum application development that how the field has evolved over time. Initially, if you, if you look at the initial algorithms that uh, you came across in the fundamentals of quantum information course, they are Oracle based algorithms. So they are basically a black box. So we have the entire algorithm chain and we take up only the part, the, the designer of the algorithm took up some part of the algorithm that they believe can be accelerated in a quantum, uh, quantum circuit model. So they took, they, hid the, in, the rest of the algorithm inside a black box, like uh, the Oracle in, a, in the Grover search. And they tried to accelerate the part of the algorithm, uh, which they thought is, um, is uh, very easy to accelerate or rather easy to accelerate on a quantum, on a quantum algorithm on a quantum circuit. The problem with that is oftentimes this black box, uh, when we try to implement the black box uh, in reality, we find that the number of gates required to implement that black box can be high. So sometimes the assumptions of the black box are not really true in pragmatic way. So when we try to implement that, we find uh, that the advantage of actually implementing the entire application as a whole might die out in uh, just implementing the black box. So uh, uh, from there, the field advanced to full circuit descriptions where people realize that and they try to figure out what's the circuit for the entire calculation that's required to implement a particular functionality or a particular applications. And they basically find out that for different applications, they need to define the black box part as well in a quantum circuit uh, in an efficient way so that we do not lose out on all the advantages. And then once we have these descriptions, again, uh, these descriptions can be arbitrarily long. So these first two blocks are uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical descriptions. So um, they describe in terms of either unitary transformations or in terms of a general uh, format of making the circuit. So they can be extended to any, any number of qubits, uh, like let's say 2048 shorts uh, RSA uh, factorization. But uh, we cannot always experiment with them. To experiment, uh, we do not have that many number of qubits. And later in, uh, in this lecture, we're going to look at why we cannot uh, look at larger number of qubits on a quantum simulator. But we can already see some part of this in, uh, in working by using uh, by functional simulation on quantum classical quantum simulators. So they simulate, as, as we saw uh, that, the worst case simulation is exponential, but most of the time it's not the worst case. We can uh, see some part of the algorithm working on a quantum simulator 
maybe not like like we cannot factorize 2048 RSA on a quantum simulator like QX, but we can see some part of it working and we can already see, uh, we can understand how it is working and we can further develop the algorithm. Uh, like we can tweak the algorithm to see which gates work better. So that's fun functional simulation. And from functional simulation, there are like two paths that normally uh, we see uh, like being taken in this uh, field. One is the fault tolerant quantum computing simulation. So again, we are, we are still working with the same tool set. We are still using the quantum simulators. But now we introduce more constraints, like uh, we can introduce things like error model, models. Uh, again, we are going to look, uh, look through it uh, in this lecture. We can also introduce things like mapping, routing. Um, so once we have logical qubits, uh, we can see uh, simulations play out in the logical qubits. We can introduce errors and we can see how, how the quantum error correction algorithms are, are helping in that or not. So that's fault tolerant quantum computing uh, simulation, FTQC. And on the other side, uh, we can just ignore the errors that are there in the current hardware and just assume that, well, let's, let's directly get our hands dirty and see it on the hardware and see how it's working. So that's uh, NIST implementations. We take the functional simulation directly without an error model and uh, apply it on the NIST hardware that's available uh, nowadays. And we see how, how the results are. And again, we can go back to the drawing board and change our algorithms, uh, use more NISC uh, compatible algorithms, more er error tolerant algorithms, and see how it affects the application that we want to uh, accelerate on. And of course, the final goal is to have the FTQC implementation. We have a much, uh, where we need a much bigger quantum hardware with much more number of connect uh, qubits and connectivity so that we can actually implement the fault current quantum computer simulations on a hardware. And there's another uh, little bit separate field which uh, developed quite separately from all this, which is the physical simulations. So these are like many body simulations in physics where we directly take the, we do not have a lot of programmability. We take a physical model. Uh, this, is, this is what basically what uh, Richard Feynman proposed to use uh, quantum computations to do physical system simulations. And we directly uh, access the NISC hardware that is already available right now and we see what we can do with them. Uh, so earlier this, uh, I think it's last year that uh, there was quite a lot of uh, news uh, about Google claiming quantum supremacy. So that Unfortunately, supremacy is not the only term around uh, in this field now. People realize that achieving supremacy is uh, neither the most important task nor is it so easy. So they invented new terms which are like quantum advantage and quantum value. And uh, it's good to understand a little bit of uh, what these terms mean to understand where we stand with respect to the long-term uh, uh, roadmap of quantum algorithm development. The first one is a uh, weak quantum value where it's okay to improve any problem. Like um, we just take up any problem and as long as a quantum plus classical model. So in combination with a classical method. So the, we use a hybrid ap approach of quantum plus classical as long as that's better than a purely classical solution, which means that the quantum computer, the quantum algorithm is adding some value to the already available solutions. So we are happy with that. So that's called as weak quantum uh, value. Again, it's any problem. It need not be anything that's uh, useful. The second one is quantum value. So it's more like a strong quantum value where we are, it's the same thing, except that we are now working on a real valuable problem to, for the society. Where again, we use a quantum computer along with a classical uh, co uh, computation. So uh, we, offload only some part of the algorithm to the quantum accelerator. And again, as long as that's better than a purely, purely classical solutions, uh, we are happy. So this is more like the realistic aim of most uh, quantum startups, quantum application startups nowadays. So they are using quantum computers along with classical computers to target a valuable problem so that they can market it. And then uh, as long as that's better than a purely classical solution. Next one is a weak quantum uh, supremacy, which is, uh, so every time we talk about quantum supremacy, it's, it's a very theoretical uh, concept. So we are not really concerned about 
the problem of having a very uh, real value in, in the society. It's a very mathematical function, which is, of course, valuable from the point of science, but not from the uh, point of society, let's say. So uh, we take up any problem on a quantum computer, and as long as it's better or faster than the available classical solution. So we run it, and we see that it's better than whatever is there on the classical uh, side. Then we take the quantum advantage. So uh, we take up a valuable problem. So quantum advantage means uh, there's always some valuable problem attached to it. We use a quantum computer. And so we are using a quantum computer over here. So the difference between quantum value and quantum advantage is this should run purely on a quantum computer. So there's no classical part to it. And as long as that's better and faster than a purely classical solution. Then comes quantum supremacy. So this is what uh, Google claimed last year, where there's a mathematical proof for supremacy. Again, it's a very theoretical uh, algorithm that we want to run. So there should be a proof that uh, for, for any input size, the quantum will remain better than the best classical algorithm possible. So there should be a very rigorous mathematical proof to it. And last but not least, this is like the holy grail of quantum application development where we have a proof that it's going to be always better as well as uh, it's actually in practice better and it's advantageous to the society. So that's like breaking RSA with quantum computers where we know that it's a very valuable problem to the society, but there's also a very um, core theoretical proof that um, it's no, no classical algorithm is going to be better than that. So why use a quantum simulator? So on one side, we have this huge um, list of problems that potentially can be accelerated on a quantum computers. Like um, there are a lot of problems in biology and theoretical computer science where we think that quantum computers are going to give us a lot of advantage based on like the core structure of uh, quantum computation or quantum information, like uh, how it's based on linear algebra. And on the other side, we do not really have um, a good enough quantum computer yet where we can actually experiment on the real hardware. So, um, so in the meanwhile, we can use a quantum simulator to again functionally understand what we are going uh, the what we are going towards, like what actually we are developing, and we can further enrich that knowledge using quantum simulators till like as long as we wait for the real quantum computers to come up. So one of the quantum computer simulator that we have uh, developed in our department uh, in Tudor is the QX simulator. So we have the quantum algorithm. So this is kind of the stack of how QX uh, simulator works. We, we have the quantum algorithms where uh, just as I showed in the last slide, there are different types of um, problems that you can try to experiment on, on quantum, uh, on quantum computer. Then we have the compiler, which does a lot of function, a uh, lot of different transformations. Again, not all of them are required for functional simulation. Simulation. Let's say we do not need all, uh, we do not always need to encode it in a error correction code, or we do not always need to introduce errors based on what we are really interested in. If we are looking for a NISC implementation, we might want to in, uh, introduce some errors and see how it's performing. But that's not always like it, it's totally up to us based on the application developer what he or she wants. And then uh, the, com the compiler gives uh, as output the quasim code, the quantum assembly language code, which can go in either a, a real quantum computer. So that's some of the devices that we have at uh, QTech. And towards the very end of today's lecture, we are going to look at the quantum inspire platform and see how how the real quantum computers actually compare with some of um, the quantum to the quantum simulator and what all we can do with it. So we have the different platforms like superconducting, spin qubits, both of which we can target using the quantum inspire platform. And then we have the quantum simulator. So we have, uh, let's say in Surfsara and I think in Amsterdam, we have uh, a huge supercomputer which runs QX. So, uh, that gives us up to 45 qubits of uh, simulation. Again, we are going to look at shortly why 45 is such a low number and why, one, why can't we go beyond it. 
but we can also run the same QX simulator on a laptop. So that's most of the exercises that you're going to do in the course where we can uh, target our laptop or the, the Intel or the AMD processors in a laptop and do the same uh, simulation of a quantum computer. So uh, what are the mathematical basis of uh, quantum simulation? So let's take a two qubit system on the standard computational basis. So we have the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 with some associated amplitudes of a qubit in it. That means we have uh, four numbers. So yeah, for a two qubit system, we have two to the power n, we have four numbers. And this is the representation of the zero zero state uh, on, in, in, the mid, uh, in the array in, or in a vector notation. So that gives us four numbers that we need to store. And since the amplitudes can be complex numbers, which means that we are basically storing eight real numbers in our in our memory, in our RAM, as long as we are doing the simulation. So what do we need to do if we want to apply some gate on a two qubit system? Let's say we want to apply two Hadamards on each of the qubits. So we want to bring them into a full superposition state. Like this are, uh, these are some of the exercises that you already did in the last class where we just multiply this two Hadamard uh, unitary matrices and we get a uh, four Cross four matrix. In general, these can again be uh, complex numbers. They need not be you know, real numbers for this particular case. For the Hadamard case, uh, they are real numbers. So, effectively, we have four to the power n into two real numbers. So, two into four to the power n uh, real numbers that we are dealing with um, while doing an unitary transform on two qubits. How does that work for a fifty qubit system? Is there uh, like can anyone guess how how big these numbers will be like how big the array will be or how big the matrix will be for a 50 qubit system. Anyone? You are two to the 100 elements. Two power hundred, uh, yeah. For like this will be four to power n, so four to power fifty. Uh, yeah, you can do it on let's say Google or Wolfram Mathematica. How how big that number will be, and this how that big will be like two to power n or two to power fifty is this big number. So that many number of um, this into two number of uh, real numbers is what you need to store uh, while doing the simulation, and for the for each unitary matrix, you have to store this into two number of uh, real values while you're doing the simulation. So that's, that's a really, really huge number. And uh, we can see how long, how, how costly in terms of memory or how costly in terms of time that's going to take, given that nice simulation. So everything that I told you in the last slide is where we do not really use any tricks, we're just going to have the entire array in our memory and then we have the entire matrix of the unitary transformation for every single step and we are going to go through it in a very naive uh, fashion how much memory does that take so uh, these are like the formulas as i said like every time we have the memory we have uh, to the power n complex mat matrix matrix to store the n qubit system and then for every circuit operation, we need uh, four to power n number of uh, like operations. So that's coming to 16 bytes of uh, operations for every single um, step. And then for the op operations, we need um, like a similar way, we need this many number of floating point op operations, flop flops. For a 25 qubit system, that means that we need this much amount of memory, which I don't know how to even say this, like giga, tera, beta, exa. So that's like exa bytes of um, memory that's required in for a 25 qu uh, qubit system. And that means even for a Xeon processor, it takes 3.47 days. And like, let's forget about uh, 30 uh, qubits for every time it's kind of multiplied by two or four. And that's amounting to 9.75 years on good enough uh, processor. 
So uh, does that mean that we cannot do simulation? As we all know that QX, you can run it on uh, your laptops and most of the, most of the exercises that we, we are going to look at in this course, maybe doesn't need 25 qubits, but at least 15 or uh, 20 qubits. So how, how is that made possible? So we, we saw that there's exponential simulation complexity if we are doing the naive way. So we are keep, uh, keeping the entire vector or the array in the memory. So of course, like in the long run, if you are giving a large enough number of qubits, it's, it's not feasible. Otherwise, why would build a quantum computer for the worst case? But how many number of qubits can we actually go up to? So that depends on how big of a system that we have, but it rather depends less on how big of a system that we have. It depends on how intelligently we are able to manipulate these values in the memory without keeping the entire amount of data in the memory. Or if we, do, if we really do not need that much data, we should not be keeping that much data on the memory. And another uh, side note is maybe even when we have uh, quantum computers, we will still want to use quantum simulation. So that's one of the another way of uh, motivating yourself to learn more about quantum simu simulators that even if when we have quantum com uh, quantum computers they're still going to be noisy for some time and they're still going to have fairly less number of qubits so we can still test our functional simulation of functional results of the algorithms on the quantum simulators before we actually they're going to let's say remain costly or um, with only few organizations. So we can still run our functional simulations on the simulator and then uh, op, like port it on a quantum computer uh, before getting the real results. Now look, uh, let's look at some of the smart simulation techniques which actually allows us to run our simula uh, simulations on uh, our laptops. So one way, of course, uh, this is most computer engineers are very familiar with is we do not need to store every single element of the ar array. And there's another way of representing a, a matrix, which is a sparse matrix representation where we store only the uh, v values which are non-zero. So we just ignore all the places where the values are zero. So we store it with the, the row and column tag and the value instead of just storing it as the entire block of the matrix. The second one is, uh, the same technique is not only applicable for the matrix, but also for the state. If a state is zero, we do not need to store it. So we can grow our vector dynamically based on which step of, which step of the computation requires how many number of uh, non-zero elements. Another way is there are some operations which are much simpler than the others. Like say Hadamard, we need to change every single element. But for the X operations, we just need to flip the, this part of the matrix, uh, this part of the vector with the lower half of the vector. So that can be done by just swaps instead of multiplying by this entire matrix, which will require much more number of operations. And of course, uh, this, is, this is not maybe for our laptops, but when we are running on the supercomputers, we, we can distribute most of the tasks on multiple cores. So that gives us a lot of speed up and that's uh, like, we can also use um, GPUs for it. And recently there was a news, uh, a Swiss quantum computing hub. They tried to run a quantum simulator on a Raspberry Pi. So um, you can use a lot of different platforms and play around with the available hardware and the multi the cores available to speed up your simulations. So uh, that is like when we do not have any idea about the algorithms, so we can anyway always use these kind of smart techniques uh, to speed up the simulations to allow us more qubits. But we if we have some inf uh, some knowledge of the particular algorithm that we want to run, we can do even better. So that's not something that uh, is natively there in QX. But let let's say you always want to accelerate a particular type of algorithm, uh, let's say Shor's algorithm, for example. Then you can have specially designed uh, parts of your um, simulator which does a particular uh, a particular operation in a much more efficient way but it's important to remember that the worst case is still exponential again if you don't have this there's no requirement to build a quantum computer in the first place but the average case case is much better so that gives us a lot of advantage over um, 
just not doing anything rather just writing a theoretical algorithm and waiting for a quantum computer to get that big in the second part of the lecture we are going to look at uh, the qx simulator so before uh, we go into the qx simulator let's have a brief uh, summary of the conventions that are followed in the qx uh, one of the convention is when we are drawing the qx simulator allows us to show the circuit so uh, when it's showing the circuit the the significant qubit that is q0 is on the top that's important because uh, that's a bit different from most of the other simulators that are available in the market and uh, this convention is based on the nielsen and chung book uh, which also uses the q0 on on the top line next when we have a string representation of the qubits in the basis uh, let's say the basis states then q0 comes on the right so the significant qubit on the right this is kind of like most um, most places it is the same when we have a vector representation um, we have the zero zero state on the top so like this may look like uh, like really stupid but it's important that uh, if we do not follow these particular conventions our results will be jumbled up so it's important to understand if when you are working out your solutions on pen and paper and then running out running it on the qx to see uh, to verify that it's correct uh, it's important to remember that when we have a vector representation um, it assumes a particular basis state over here it's the zero zero state so when we have this uh, complex array it's based on the computational basis state and uh, as far as i know there's no other way to visualize it on qx it's always the computational basis that we are working with when we have the multi qubit operations the the right operator acts on the least significant qubit so the right operator operates on q0 and the left operator operates on q1 and that's how we would need we would want to multiply the matrix to understand how our qubits are acting on this particular state the vector representation of the state which means that this is like the standard representation of c0 gate but this is like the standard representation of this c0 gate uh, like standard matrix representation of the c0 gate which is flipped in our case because we consider the lsq on the top which means that this c0 gate actually corresponds to this particular matrix while uh, the standard c0 matrix represents uh, this particular circuit let's look at how qx simulator does the simulation so we have the quasm file we have the input c quasm or what we call as a common quasm file uh this is how the code looks like and that is uh, we can also look at the circuit view of this particular quasm file and it's always one to one so uh, it's not very hard to see how the, this hadamard gate is on q0 so again q0 is on the top then we have the c0 gate and then we measure out all the qubits these two double lines means that we have classical data after it it's like standard uh, conventions in quantum uh, computing then we feed in the c quasm file into the qx simulator and we get as the output this is how the output mostly looks like whether it's the command line interface or the gui uh, the output looks uh, somewhat similar so we have the quantum state um, this this is basically the bell pair right so we have the hadamard gate and the c0 which creates the standard bell pair so we have only the 00 state and the 11 state so it's important to remember that um, the states which are which has zero amplitude so 01 and 10 state they are not represented over here so that's again related to how we are storing it in the memory we are not storing every single state and then uh, we have the measure, measurement resistor so if we measure out otherwise this values don't really mean anything if we measure it out then uh, we'll see the value out in the measurement resistor so over here it doesn't mean that uh, qx already knows the value as 00 it means that it just doesn't know anything so that's uh, that's given by the measurement predictor so don't care means we didn't perform any measurement so we should not trust out uh, trust what these values are if we did a measurement so it means that we know what the measurements uh, are right now and then we can look at the measurement resistor so there's one command which is a display command which allows us to actually print out so if you do not put the display command it's not going to print out anything so that's something that you need to remember so every time we put a display command is going to print out the quantum state and the measurement resistor 
Also over here, you can see that since we did the measurement, the state has collapsed to one of the, to one of the superposition state of the bell pair. And over here in this particular case, it is the zero zero state. Okay, now let's take a short break for 15 minutes and then we are going to return with the second part of the lecture. Welcome back to the second part of the lecture. Hmm. Am I audible by the way? Yes, we can hear you. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, so there was a small, just a second. Let's see my presentation here. Let's start a presentation again. Yeah, uh, so there was a small error in the slide. Uh, the quantum state is one one. And um, yeah, it was uh, zero, 0, earlier. That's corrected now. So quantum state is one, one, and we uh, what we get in the measurement resistor is one, one again. So how is the quasim syntax? Uh, what does the quantum uh, quasim syntax look like or the C quasim, the common quasim syntax? Firstly, uh, we have a quantum uh, program header, which is there in the latest work version of C quasim, not in this particular version that we have for the quantum studio, that is uh, the one that you are going to use for the exercises. Then uh, a common begins with uh, a hash. And then uh, we have we have to define the number of qubits uh, up front. So we need to know how big our circuit is going to be. That's with the keyword qubits. And then uh, we can define sub circuits. Uh, the usefulness of that will be, uh, I will present it in the next slide where it is defined by this dot. So once we have the dot, we can give a name to this part of the circuit. That's like, let's say entangle. And then we have the different uh, different gates, of course. Uh, we have the Hadamard gate, the C0 gate, uh, with the first qubit as a control, and the second one is the target. Every time we just put measure, it means that we measure in the Z basis or the Z basis. And if you want to display only the binary results of measurements, uh, we can display, uh, we can use the keyword display binary. Uh, there's a small disclaimer about display command. So you have to remember that that's fake. So it's, it's not what you can normally use when we are using a real quantum computer. You cannot read all the amplitudes out of the wave function. But also since like we do not have a quantum computer yet, why not use it as long as we are doing functional simulation? So of course, we are giving up the speed up of quantum computation. So we should get some benefits, right? So that's where uh, display comes in, where we measure, uh, we can get all the probabilities, all, all the amplitudes out, uh, right? actually not the prob probabilities, we get all the complex amplitude out of every single state evolution if we want, which helps us to design really, uh, it really helps us to design algorithms so we can already know, we don't have to do so many number of measurements and uh, aggregate only the probabilities. We can see the entire uh, superposition state of the amplitudes and design the algorithms uh, better. In the next uh, two slides, I'll just uh, list down all the uh, QX syntax for different gates. We have the Hadamard, the uh, poly gates, X, Y, Z. Then we have the rotation. Uh, this angle is given in radian. So we can give arbitrary angles to it. it. It need not be between zero to pi or zero to two pi. It can be anything, it just wraps around. And then uh, we have the phase gate. Then we have the T gate, the T dagger. Then we have the C naught. We can use both C naught or C X, whatever you want. It doesn't really uh, differentiate it. Also, uh, the entire uh, these gate definitions are case insensitive, so uh, it doesn't matter if you write it in caps or in small. Uh, then we have the Toffoli gate. We have the Swap gate, uh, which is basically three C naughts in reverse order. Then we have the C phase, or also known as the C X uh, C Z gate. We can use either of them. Doesn't matter. Then we have a controlled rotation gate where uh, we have the control qubit and the tar uh, target qubit and the control qubit. Again, uh, so we 
can also use this, the second form that is the CX and the CZ. Uh, we can also use it with binary control. So that's how it differs from the C phase and the C naught. Uh, that doesn't allow you binary controls, but uh, we can use these two uh, keywords by even after measurement. So we can use the measure, measured classical bit value to control the quantum state. Uh, that that will become clear that it's important for some algorithms to have uh, the measurement results of the classical algorithm control the quantum uh, state. And lastly, we have the prep Z, which is uh, preparing the qubit in the Z basis, or it basically gives you the pristine uh, ground state or the zero state uh, in the computational basis, makes uh, Q0 back to the zero state. It's not only in the beginning of the circuit, you can also use prep Z anywhere in between the circuit, just uh, resets the qubit. Then we have the classical control bit, uh, as I said, like you can use the binary controls. So uh, you can measure out the qubit and use that binary uh, the binary value to control the qubit okay so this works with a hyphen uh, in between so that's not what was there in the slide so that's that's a uh, error you have to uh, put the hyphen in there and you can also use uh, multiple uh, binary bits to control it so when all of them are high only then uh, it flips the, uh, the state of the qubit q4 so you, this, I think there's no limit from the QX, but it depends on uh, your native system, how many number of binary controls are allowed. And then uh, you can also use a mask. So there are some classical instructions that you can use along when you measure out a qubit. So since you are measured out, let's say Q0. Okay, uh, so that's one thing that I forgot to mention. Every time you measure out a Q0, uh, Q0 it stores the binary value in the keyword B0. So the quant qubit and the bit. So there's always the one-to-one -one relation between uh, the number over here and the same number for the measured out value. So uh, you can flip this bit out. So now if this bit is uh, zero, then the control is high. And then it will flip. If B0 is zero and B1 is one, then it will flip uh, Q4. And then again, we can always uh, invert and restore the value if you need it for further computation. Okay, uh, so uh, as I said that uh, you can have uh, sub circuits with the keyword dot, so that we can use it to iterate multiple times. Of course, uh, if you're using a GUI, it's not very difficult. You can just uh, copy this part of the circuit and paste it twice, but like, as we go higher up in the high level programming hierarchy, we want to like, ease the process uh, for the programmer. So we can just uh, specify how many times we want to run this sub circuit in this bracket, in the first bracket. And if you say twice, it just uh, loops over uh, two times. Uh, it's, it's also very important to uh, just keep in mind that if we measure out the qubit inside a sub circuit, it doesn't mean that the measurement is going to get reset. So if we collapse our superposition while inside a sub-circuit, it's going to remain collapsed. So that's something that you need to uh, remember if, when we are using sub-circuits. Okay, so uh, also another thing is parallelism. So we, uh, this is basically the form of loop used in the quantum assembly language. The second one is uh, parallelism. So if we use the second bracket and this uh, bar or the pipe uh, symbol, then uh, these things are effectively executed in parallel. You don't need to worry about how it's actually done uh, back end in the uh, hardware, but uh, let's say we can do some part of the, the quantum circuit in parallel. If you, if you remember the C0 dance uh, in the fundamentals of uh, quantum information course, we can do quite a lot of things in parallel. So that's, uh, for example, over here, we can have this four harder marks uh, in parallel executed. So that, that's also related to one of the exercises that you're going to do. How do you schedule the circuit or schedule the uh, circuit in such a way that uh, we can do some of the operations in parallel. And so this, uh, this circuit is going to get executed in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and seven clock ticks um, in, in, a quantum, in a real quantum chip if you can parallelize this operation. Uh, so, 
as long as you're doing functional simulation, it doesn't, it's not going to affect the functionality of your algorithm. So you're going to get the same uh, results, whether you execute the, this parallel circuit or the sequential circuit. But uh, what's important to remember is if you're doing, let's say an algorithm analysis of how many number of steps your circuit is going to take, then this actually comes into uh, play. You can, uh, you can see how many lines of code you have in your uh, parallel circuit and infer how much speed up your algorithm is going to give with respect to the classical solution. And uh, another important thing over here is a circuit which can be parallelized in this way doesn't mean that it can be executed in parallel when we have a quantum uh, chip. There are other important factors that is going to come into play. For example, there can be some control signals, uh, microwave control signals, which uh, you cannot use those, uh, let's say, two uh, digital to analog or analog to digital converters at the same time. So it doesn't mean that you can do these two C naught means you can actually do it on the quantum chip that uh, you want to work on, let's say, the ones that we have in QTEC. Okay, the, the next feature is uh, noisy circuits. And I said that after the functional simulation, you want to move towards uh, what's available on the hardware. So you want to have some error models, uh, which there are different ways of specifying uh, errors in quantum uh, computing. And one of them is a depolarizing channel. So uh, that means that you, you, you have to use this particular command. So we have the error model and we say that depolarizing channel and we have a probability value over here, which effectively translates to an error pro probability of the poly X, Y, and Z errors inserted at every step in the circuit. So once you specify this uh, error model, what is done internally is for every step in the circuit, for every single uh, qubit line, it basically rolls a die. It, uh, it takes up a random value. And if it's uh, less than 0 0.01, it inserts one of these uh, poly gates um, in this particular part of the circuit. So for each of this uh, E blocks over here, it rolls a die and it sees whether it's uh, less than this probability value that you specify and it inserts one of these gates randomly. So that's how you uh, simulate the noisy circuit with depol the depolarizing channel. And again, you can play around this different values and see that as you increase the probability at some point of time, your circuit is just going to give random results that you cannot uh, predict with the circuit that you uh, initially started off with. So how does the QX simulator that we were looking at looks like? This is the, this is the boring command line interface where um, this is the bell pair experiment that I showed. So initially this is how, uh, if you put the display command in, this is how the quantum state is going to look at, uh, look like. So we have the complex amplitude. So there's the real part and the imaginary part for the zero zero state. And then again, for the one one state, we have uh, one over square root of two for each of the, amplitudes and uh, if you measure out then it collapses to one of the state so over here it's the one one state and we have the 100 percent probability 100 percent chance of getting the one one state after the measurement so it collapsed the superposition and we have the measurement resistor as one one and for each step of the circuit execution we also get some housekeeping values of how long it took for the circuit so you can see that uh, when we run bigger circuits it's going to take a hell lot of time and we, are, we really have to wait for a long time and you know, laptop fans are going to make a lot of noises. But uh, we won't be looking at such big simulations in our exercises so that we don't fry up our laptops in the uh, while doing the exercises for this course. Yeah, so that's just part of the simulator output that I just explained. How do we execute the circuit? So we have the you know, quantum simulator that you can download from uh, the link that's already there in the Brightspace announcement. So uh, you exec uh, you take that executable with dot slash and you select, uh, you, the second argument is basically where you have uh, your your circuit defined. It, it's basically a text file, text format file where uh, with the extension dot QC and you take that file and uh, with the executable and you get the output, the, this output out. We also happen to have a GUI uh, which works for Mac and Linux. And this is how the GUI looks like. So if this is basically the execute button, you always have to save your file before you execute it. 
So uh, you can write your code over here, or you can open it from uh, an already existing CUI file. And then uh, this is how, when, when you execute it, this is where you'll get your measurement result. And uh, this is the circuit drawer. So if you click that, you are going to get the output of the circuit. Again, uh, remember that at the top qubit is Q0 for this, uh, for this output. Sometimes you'll see that uh, this circuit output is very small. So this is some of the debugging I'm already doing ahead of time where you see that uh, some of this, sometimes this circuit will come up over here very small. So if you run it a couple of times, uh, the circuit dryer with resizing this output windows, uh, most pro uh, like you're expected to get the, the circuit out where it will use up the entire available space of the circuit dryer. So how do you read out this particular part of the output? This is how, as I said, that this is how the output is going to look, uh, look like, where we have the LSQ on Q0 and uh, Q0 on the right side and Q1 on the left side. Yeah, and um, we do not show the outputs where if the amplitudes are zero, but even if the amplitudes are really small, like if, um, if it's above the uh, precision value that's used in QX, we're going to show those outputs. And uh, they are sorted in order, in order of the basis state. Then the measurement predictor is either zero, one, or X. So X means we have not performed any measurement out on the qubit. And if, if it has performed a measurement, it's going to show uh, the measurement out in the output, uh, the, out, the measure, measured value in the output resistor, which is the measurement resistor. So these are some of the really simple examples uh, on QX. And I'll, I'll try to show you on the GUI how it works. You are most welcome if you have your laptops, uh, like QX installed in your laptops, you can just follow along with me. It's like really difficult to have an interactive session on Zoom. Uh, let's see how, how far we can get to that. Yeah, so uh, this is again how the GUI look, uh, looks like. So first we have to specify the number of qubits. Let's take uh, qubit one for the first exercise. We just want to do an X gate. So uh, the first thing is you mostly want to, you normally want to prepare your qubit. So that is uh, very true when you're doing an experiment, but uh, if you're doing on QX, it's uh, initially it's always in the zero state, so you can just uh, skip it unless the exercises require you to do it. Uh, so you prepare your Q0, and you can uh, display your qubit over here. So let's uh, save it, and then we run the circuit out. So we see that uh, it's in the Q0 uh, state. So even if you, so that's how we comment it out. So if we comment it out, we see that it's yeah anyway it's still uh, in the zero state. So let's prepare our qubits and we saw that it's in the zero state. And if we measure it out, it still remains in the zero state, of course. We measure it out multiple number of times, it's still in the zero state. And then we can, let's say, do an X gate on Q0. So it's going to flip it. Okay, let us see the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, so GUI is uh, not available for Windows. I can show you how it works just uh, in a second. I'll just uh, show you how it works on the Linux, the GUI, and then I'll show you how it works on the uh, Windows uh, machine, okay? Yeah, so uh, over here, we can just flip this qubit out, and then if we measure it out, well, we don't really uh, see the results because we didn't use the display command. So unless we use really the display command, it's not going to show us what we did. 
So it's still in the zero state. That's why we use our display command. But if we put a display over here now, then we see that, yes, the bit got flipped and we see the bit got flipped in the right way. Now, instead of X, if we use a Hadamard, of course, the expected value is, is going to flip it to the superposition. That we can see using our display command again over here. So we start off with the zero state, then it got to the equal superposition state. And then we measure out just one, like it collapses superposition to either of these values. If we run it multiple times, you see that zero over here, the one got flipped to zero over here. And just look at that, it's going to uh, flip it around 50% of the time. Yeah. So uh, let's have a quick look at how it's done on Windows. So like, let's see. I have to get up Linux first. So I don't have a QX downloaded on my system, so I'm going to download it. Uh, so you can see it, the entire process in a way, that's good. Quantum Studio. So this is the website, and then you take up this particular file, which Hi, is- Rita, uh, we, cannot, we cannot see the website, oh. we can only see your, your slides. Yeah, I can see it now. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so we have the Quantum Studio website, and then we have this file, which is a QX simulator for Microsoft Windows. We download that. So we have the file over here, then uh, we unzip it. So we extract the, the compressed file. Okay, so uh, this is uh, basically the executable. And now uh, we have to open Windows PowerShell. So from the command prompt, just type in uh, PowerShell there. I have to close the presentation. Yeah. yeah, so this is how PowerShell looks like. And then we go to a lot of Linux commands actually work on PowerShell, similar com commands. So now we have PowerShell and then we go navigate to the folder where we extracted it. Yeah. So we see the same files in there. Again, go one more step in. Yeah. So now uh, we again execute the same command that we had for Linux dot slash QX and then uh, inside the examples, we have the EPR, EPR which is uh, basically the bell pair experiment. So the important thing to remember is we use PowerShell over here. So when we use PowerShell, uh, um, we use the same commands as, as I shown in the slides in Linux and we get the same output out. So prepare the bell state and let's look at what this example actually was. So we have the Hadamard gate on Q0, then we have the C0. So basically we are displaying every single step of the, uh, the EPR pair. So we have 
uh, the Hadamard on only the first qubit, so that brings it to the superposition of 0, 0, and 0, 1. Then we do the C0, so that brings, uh, makes the Bell pair out, 0, 0, and 1, 1. Then we measure out one of the qubits, so that basically collapses to the 1, 1 state, and then we see that it's uh, fully correlated. So the second qubit is, uh, it again, uh, stays in the 1, 1 state, and we see the same output up. So that's how we do it on Windows. I hope that's clear now. But uh, you can always uh, reach out to me if you have any problem with uh, working on Windows. It should work, like PowerShell should work. Otherwise, of course, uh, tomorrow again, we have the office hours, so you can come to me and you can share your screen and you can work it out with you if it's not working. Okay, let's uh, go back to the presentation again. Yeah, so that's how, um, QX, it works on QX. This is basically the circuit that you have to run to, uh, for those exercises. And then uh, we have some bigger circuits. Uh, it's not that big, it's not as big as an algorithm, but again, you can try this out later in your, in your laptop, uh, in your systems, and if you have any doubt, you can always reach out to me. So the, and these are how uh, the circuits would look like. And you can, uh, you can verify that the swap gate is basically this, uh, this particular sequence of C naughts, and we get the same result out if we display uh, the results. Uh, another important thing to remember that if you are really designing an algorithm and you really want to verify uh, what the results are, since uh, with display command, you get out the entire superposition of the, uh, of the state of the amplitudes, you normally want to put all your qubits in the superposition state. So in this step, right, right after you define your qubits, sometimes when you are designing an algorithm, you want to uh, just put it on the equal superposition, like uh, Hadamard on all the qubits, so that you can verify all your answers out uh, in, in one shot. So later in, in, the, um, in the exercise, we are go going to look at quantum adders. So let's say you want to verify that the adder works for every single binary representations. So you can just put it on the Hadam, uh, put in Hadamard on all the qubits and verify that it's working for every single output. So you get a lot of conf confidence based on the display and those Hadamard uh, wrapper uh, for algorithm design. Teleportation. So that's one of the most important uh, features of quantum computing. You can do a teleportation, um, not, not like beam, beam me up Scotty, but uh, with uh, subat subatomic particles or with qubits as uh, like the abstraction of it. So uh, the most important thing about teleportation is you need to have a bell pair shared between your two parties. So that's basically what pr uh, prevents using teleportation uh, between unknown, like people who have never met or have never shared any quantum uh, states between themselves. So the first step is you need to share your bell pair. So you need to transport one part of your bell pair to the second party over here. So that gives you uh, this particular superposition state, the bell, uh, bell state. And then let's say you want to uh, teleport this particular qubit. So you have a particular um, amplitude is uh, alpha zero and alpha one. That's uh, this superposition state, not an equal superposition, a particular superposition state. And you want to share this uh, uh, bell pair to the party over here. This is basically what you do. You uh, do the opposite of what you did uh, to make the bell pair. So you run the C naught first, and you basically de-entangle it, and you do the Hadamard, and then you measure it out. And then you have to send, uh, send this to classical data to your receiver. And that's basically what prevents it. Since you have to share these two classical bits, it prevents faster than light communication. So you need to, and you cannot uh, transport this classical bit faster than light. So yeah, beam me up, Scotty is not really possible. It is not instantaneous transfer of data. You need to transport this uh, data to the other party and then they can do some corrections. So these are the classical controlled operations that we saw some time back where we use this classical bits to flip, uh, to apply an X gate or a Z gate on the qubit pair, the bell pair that uh, this party has, Bob or Alice, that's normally what's used. And then we get the receive state out. So you can do the math and we're gonna look at it again later. But uh, right here in QTech, uh, about 
five years back, we had uh, one of the most foolproof uh, experiments uh, to prove this Bell test, like the local hidden variable theories is also like what Einstein was uh, supporting in the later half of his life. But then uh, like John Bell's uh, test stood out for a very long time. And that's one of the, and it's very difficult to maintain uh, some of the experimental parameters of this test. And this was done right here. Unfortunately, you cannot visit the campus right now. But uh, we have the physics building over here, right beside the Ola. And then we have the EV, and this is the nuclear reactor. So these are the three places where uh, this experiment was carried out. And the bell pair was distributed. And then we did the measurements faster than uh, it, it can causal, causally affect the second part. And you can check out how the experiment was done in this YouTube video. And uh, also, the, uh, the second important result was in Delft, the scientists in QTech also did an on-demand entanglement link, which means that before the entanglement collapsed, we were able to create another entangled pair. So the entangled was the entanglement swapping allowed us to keep that bell pair alive for as long as we as we, as we want for our experiment. So that's also something that's uh, really important when we want to do quantum communication or uh, must have heard about the experiment of quantum internet that's being carried out over here. So that's uh, also what it uh, helped uh, scientists toward, move towards that experiment. Okay, this is something that I'll not go too much into that you can try it out uh, in your laptops later on. So this is the circuit that we discussed and how would that look on QX? So uh, the circuit begins from here. So we have the Q0, Q1, Q2. On, on QX, on the Q, uh, QX simulator, we have the Hadamard, C0, C0 and Hadamard. So we have to assume that Q0 is, uh, is with one of the parties and let's say Alice and Q2 is with Bob. And then Q1 has to be transferred from Bob. So Bob uh, executes this part of the circuit and then uh, sends Q1 to Alice. And then Alice did, does her part of uh, the circuit manipulation and sends these two bits, classical bits back to Bob where Bob does these two um, classical controlled operations and finally gets the qubit out. So the code would look like this. You can add commands on to uh, show uh, which part of the circuit it belongs to. Then again, we really didn't uh, have to break it down into sub circuits over here, but that's again for readability. You can either use a command or a sub circuit, it's up to you. Uh, like we were not looping in this particular circuit. But then uh, these are the different parts of the circuit that you see over here, uh, which gets executed over here. So over here, uh, in this particular circuit, uh, Alice transports a one state. So we perform an X gate on her qubit. So the one state basically what gets teleported to Bob. But uh, based on what operation we perform over here is basically preparing this psi qubit. So uh, if we change the gate set over here, we can create uh, whatever state we uh, whatever information we want to teleport from Alice to Bob. Let's say we uh, we we replace the X with an H, so we uh, put a Hadamard on Q0. So then uh, the Hadamard, the equal superposition state, gets teleported to Bob. It's also something to remember that even if Bob gets the equal superposition state. Uh, he has only one copy of it. So if he measures it out in the end, uh, he won't be able to get all the information that Alice wanted to send to Bob. So, uh, so that's important. Even if it uh, teleports the entire quantum state, we want to get the classical information out of, uh, of the quantum state that gets teleported. You might need multiple uh, runs of this entire experiment uh, for, for Bob to reconstruct the, class, uh, the quantum information in the qubit teleported uh, that gets teleported from Alice. The circuit that's exact opposite to uh, teleportation is called super dense coding. So, uh, in teleportation, we were transporting two classical bits. Uh, we, are trans uh, we are teleporting one uh, bell pair and later two classical bits from Alice to reconstruct uh, a state. In super dense coding, we do the exact opposite. We have a previously shared bell pair, just like in teleportation, but we teleport one qubit. 
whereas uh, the receiver gets two classical bits of information. So we can encode two classical bits of information in one qubit. That's more than what we can do with uh, Shannon's classical information theory. So uh, we can inf uh, encode this information again with the binary controlled uh, operations in QX. And we uh, encode it on two different basis state. We uh, encode it on the X direction of, let's say, the block sphere. And the second bit in the Z direction on the block sphere. And then we teleport again this, this uh, color rainbow line shows that that's a classical, uh, that's a quantum communication channel over here. Uh, the qubit gets teleported to Bob, and then he does the exact op uh, operation that Alice did last time. So it's just the, the entire operation is reversed in this case. We first do the encoding, and then we do the decoding of the bell pair. And uh, Bob gets out these two bits of uh, binary information, these two classical bits of information at his end. And so this was given in the paper in 1992. But if there's no shared inf entanglement, it's not possible to send two bits of classical information. That will be a violation of what would, what's known as the Holevko theorem of quantum information and communication. We need to have some previously shared entanglement to do this trick to gain the advantage over classical communication and send two bits of data using one quantum bit. The useful resources, uh, yeah, again, this is already mentioned in uh, the announcement in Bright Space. But these are some of the papers that you can look into, like most of the lectures that I discussed about uh, in the lecture, uh, like it's there in this paper, how QX works, the underlying uh, me mechanisms to uh, the smart simulation that I talked about, the different methods of uh, accelerating and like simulating more qubits given an, a fixed hardware. But there are also other simulators available. We have the Project Q and then again, Liquid, that's from Microsoft. And I think this has been renamed to QSDK now. But there are also like Carmina discussed in the last lecture, there are, uh, there's the Qiskit from IBM. We have the Forest from uh, Rigetti. And uh, so, but like I've tried out a lot of tools and uh, QX really stands out in number of qubits uh, that it can simulate. And the same, the same platform can be used both on the laptop as well as on a supercomputer. So that really helps. Uh, if you look at Qiskit, I have used it for quite some time. It, it's me, uh, mostly meant for targeting the IBM systems. So it's not meant to be a quantum simulator. It's supposed to be a functional simulator before you offload the same uh, computation problem to IBM. So that's where uh, QX helps you. It helps develop an application fully in a quantum simulator without worrying about the current state of the art of quantum, uh, quantum computers or quantum processors that's available. So we are coming towards the last part of the lecture. So let's end with some fun resources. There are like, yeah, we have the electronics for quantum computation course, but there are other ways to learn, of course. And one of the best ways to learn that I figured out is by playing games. And this is one of the game that uh, IBM invented. It's called the Entanglion, I think so. Yeah. And uh, it's a board game. So if you really like playing games, you can try it out. So this is kind of like the block sphere. So you can put your qubits to different uh, states. And we have this different die and different cards, which gives you special powers to flip out your qubit or to do like coding or error corrections. So you can just look at how the game is played. I think you can even print out the game yourself if you want and play it. So that's for board games. There are also a lot of online uh, games, sweeper, battleships, chess, and there, there are a lot of games. And this is just like few of the games that I have played with. Uh, I like I've tried it out. Some of them are really good. But uh, I recently figured out there's a GitHub page where like it, in 2019, somebody started listing all the quantum games that are uh, available. So you can check this link out and see some more games which are available that really gives, gives you the intuition to develop uh, quantum algorithms. That takes us to the last part of, the, uh, of the, today's lecture, which is the most important uh, takeaway from today's lecture is 
we really do not have to wait for the quantum hardware to start developing. We can already do a lot with quantum simulators. The main reason for that is the worst case simulator exponential, as we discussed, was that's very rare. So a lot of quantum steps, a lot of the steps in a quantum algorithm will not be the worst case. Of course, uh, there will be a stage where we are going to use the full superposition or entangle a lot of qubits. So that's where your simulation is going to get slow. But you can already test some parts of your circuit, what's called as unit tests, uh, to get some intuition of how it's uh, behaving functionally. You don't really have to wait for the current state of the quantum hardware uh, to mature, and you can already start quantum hacking. This is a real quantum hacker, at least he claims to be from Canada, and he does a lot of experiments uh, on his own for on quantum computers. So uh, I'll end today's uh, lecture with a de uh, demo of the Quantum Inspire platform, which really came out eight days back. It's a week back on 28th April, which was uh, released. So that uh, platform earlier, it was uh, like, it was there for, uh, there around for quite some time, but uh, we only had the quantum uh, simulator there, the QX simulator was running in the backend. So uh, it was allowing us anyway to do the things that we can do on QX. Last time uh, in this lecture, we didn't use it because of course the QX is much uh, easier to install on your local systems, whereas uh, this was a platform on the cloud. But this time they introduced uh, both the uh, superconducting qubits and the spin qubits. So we can test um, your algorithm on real hardware. And I'm gonna show you a small uh, demo of that today. And let me uh, end this presentation again. Uh, these slides, the PDF will be there on um, on Brightspace, so you can look at this video where Leo DiCarlo explains uh, how the Quantum Inspire platform was developed over the years. Yeah, uh, so. This is my account and there you can already make your own project uh, and yeah so uh, this is the platform where you can execute this is how the uh, GUI looks like it's very similar to how uh, the quantum studio is and then you can execute your hardware on various platforms. We, we have the different backends. Uh, we have the spin qubits and also the star mod. So uh, that's like a five qubit system. And then uh, we also have spin two, which is a two qubit uh, sim uh, single electron spin qubits. And we can, yeah, you can check it out for yourself. We have the different stack layers. Again, uh, the same things that Carmina discussed in the last lecture, different stack layers that are required to execute on, and program a quantum computer. So let's uh, look at how it works. And this is a de uh, demo program that I already ran on the Starmon some time back. It takes about a minute to run some 100 gates. Not 100, I think some 30 gates that it did. So I wasn't doing anything really fancy. So I was just uh, flipping around the qubits Q0 and Q1. Uh, just note that the syntax is a bit different from uh, the version that is uh, there on the uh, Quantum Studio. So over here, the, basically the only difference is we have uh, the square bracket around the qubit ID. So basically what we're is just flipping every time uh, and this every two of this X should cancel out. It's an unit tree and uh, I am using only two qubits out of the five qubits. Uh, another important thing about Quantum Inspire is even if you are using two qubits, you have to define uh, all the qubits that are available on the platform. So if, I, if I'm using the Starmon, uh, I have to define five qubits over here and then I can use only two of them. Also note that there's a connectivity limitation over here. So we cannot just uh, connect all the five qubits at the same time. And then uh, that's also something different. Over here, we cannot me uh, measure a specific qubit out. We have to measure out all the qubits that are there on the platform. 
which is important given that in uh, in real life there are errors associated with every qubit so if you're not really measuring out all the qubits and something got entangled with your the your work qubits the qubits that you are using then you will not gain full information about the system this is how the results um, look like so when you are flipping around and it cancels out you expect the entire state to be in the zero zero state so i'm using only these two qubits out let's say so i uh, i would expect it to be on the uh, like the full 100% over here but i'm getting only 55.9% so that shows that even for a small circuit like this which is nothing compared to what you're going to do in our exercises uh, we are not getting a very good result so that's also one of the reasons why we don't have our exercises on this platform yet and uh, we are getting a host of other noisy results out we see some of the noises come from qubits that we didn't even touch so let's say this qubit we didn't even do any operation on this qubit but uh, we are get it got clipped from 0 to 1 that's a small demo of the quantum inspire platform uh, that's available right now you can the exciting part of it that you can already use like this thing was already a dream few years back that use a real quantum computer and do some experiment however noisy it might be but that's available right now you can try it out for yourself get an account and uh, try playing around with it you can uh, like send the uh, your feedbacks to qtech scientists your own professors and i hope they are going to uh, improve the platform over the years and make it um, you know uh, make it better for our own experimentation for this course as well and hopefully next year we are going to have our ex exercises on this platform okay um, that should be the end of today's lecture thank you for attending and tomorrow we again we have the uh, the ta hours uh, if you have any problem installing because on thursday or friday i think on friday we are going to post the first ex uh, exercises the first assignments so you better have your qx platform running Either the CUI or GUI doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the Quantum Studio, even if the CUI is perfectly okay. And if you have any problem installing, uh, we can sort it out uh, tomorrow. And uh, I hope today's lecture will get recorded in the right way. So I'll post the link uh, to today's lecture, those who could not attend, or if you want to have a look back at it again. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Is there anything that you want Thank to say? Thank you, Arita.